On today's episode, we are going to learn a lot about negotiation with Tarcicio Alvarez Rivero, who is lecturer at Cornell's Brooks School of Public Policy. Tarcicio brings a vast amount of experience to this discussion. He was a longtime negotiator at the United Nations, and he's done some truly fascinating work all around the world. I think he brings really unique insight into this discipline. You'll learn how to move beyond the all-too-typical winner-loser framework that we so often associate with negotiations. Instead, we learn how to maximize the value exchange for all parties, how to embrace empathy and use it as a tool, and ultimately learn how to turn adversaries into allies. How cool is that? Check out the episode notes for details on Professor Alvarez Rivero's Negotiating Policy Solutions online course at Cornell, and hit that subscribe button if you enjoy the show. Listeners, here's my conversation with Tarcicio. So how do you like to begin to teach negotiations? So let's think about your classroom setting. What do we talk about on day one? Well, at day one, we, we want to try to frame the whole concept of negotiations. Most of the time, we, we see negotiations as a sort of conflict scenario. I, I want something, you have something, I'm going to get it from you with the least amount of expense to me, right? And we do that through our day. Every situation where somebody cues us into a yes or no answer, it turns out to be a negotiation. We live in a very competitive situation and we reinforce it by the way we approach negotiations or how we deal with other people. The way I start in class is to essentially get people to sort of understand that we do that at the personal level, at the professional level, and that there is a different way to approach those relationships. There's a way where we should emphasize working with the other person so that we both get value out of the encounter. And that it isn't necessary to put ourselves in a situation where there has to be a conflict or a unfair exchange of value, let's say. There are a lot of components that come into that, sociological and psychological, that are not necessary. A lot of the discussions we've had up till now before the show, there's been a through line, which is preparation, right? And when it comes to outlining the terms for the negotiation, setting the table, so to speak, right? It's kind of, you need some clarity. And one term that kept coming up is this concept of value exchange. Is it what it sounds like? Well, for most people, no. Uh, for people just automatically assume that value is necessarily money. Yeah. Right? And it isn't. It's what you get for the money. It's what you get for the money. What, what is the usefulness of that to you? You know, let's say if, 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 if I am trading with you for a particular unusual coffee drinking cup, right? The value of that to me might be that my grandmother used to have one that looked like it. And the value is a lot higher for me than what you could ever perceive if you don't understand that relationship to my grandmother, right? Mm -hmm. So value has a lot of components that go beyond currency. And this is why I try to explain the most important thing is that we need to begin to understand why the other person is in the negotiation. Because that why gives you why is it of value to them. There's a purpose for them talking to you. If you spend the time to figure out why they're there, then you begin to understand what value is it that they consider important and how do you get that for them while getting what you need. It becomes a lot easier if you spend the time to worry about why they're engaging with you in this exchange. Another concept that was kind of the through line of our conversation was to understand that in negotiations, it's useful and instructive to understand that there's not going to be a winner and a loser, right? With value exchange, there's something ideally in, in any good negotiation for each party to take away. We're talking about a term a little bit more familiar, but value proposition, right? So as far as how do you get into the mindset of making sure that you're demonstrating your own value proposition, that you're providing clarity for your counterpart on the other side? And also, how do you better understand the other one? So, so, so we're talking about shifting negotiations from a um, opposing view to making negotiation a exercise in cooperation to gain value on both sides. So when you do that, you have different strategies uh, that we reflect on the course on how you get to the point where you understand why the other person is there, what they need and why they need it. And then oftentimes depending on how well you prepare and who the other person you're talking to, one of the strategies that we recommend is just tell the other person, listen, I'm, I want this because of this. This is why this is important to me. Sometimes a show of vulnerability sort of puts a little bit of onus on the other person to be just as vulnerable and just as honest. But the thing that gets you there is preparation. It gets you to understand if you know ahead of time what type of person you're dealing with, what kind of situation they're in, 
you can begin to see how you engage in that conversation so that you give that person space to be in their position. It's okay for them to want what they want for the reason that they want. You're not there to judge them. You're there to try to find a way so that your interest is satisfied and their interest is satisfied as much as possible. And that's your purpose in negotiations is not extracting value, is you getting value. Yeah. One thing I didn't really kind of say, and maybe I should have stated it perhaps because it's obvious, but the things we're talking about here, these concepts are universally applicable, right? If we're negotiating with our boss to get a raise or we're making a business proposition to somebody else, or you know what I mean? Go all the way up to international peace agreements or whatever. All of these things that you're talking about apply, yes? I, I often tell my students that had I known what I know now, my relationship with my father would have been very different. Why? Because I would have been a lot more empathetic about why he took the positions he took. I would have been able to sort of understand and give him space to believe what he wanted to believe and not judge. And often what we do is we come in with pre-assumed judgments on people or situations that are not necessary. If we just took the time, not only want to listen, but to truly listen. Oftentimes we listen while having the voices in our head making judgments at the same time. If we're really going to listen, we have to shut that down and actually allow people the space to have their position, their beliefs, and not assume that just because they're different, that they're somehow less logical. It's logical for them. I'll, I'll try to explain. People see reality from their perspective based on what they've experienced in their lives, their culture, their background, society, life experiences. That's the way our brains work. That's the way our psychology works. For me to judge Christopher on just because I just met you and then assume that because you look this way or because you have this accent or because you have this other thing, this is the way you are, takes away that part of you that actually makes you and allows you to make decisions. As a good negotiator, I have to have empathy towards you. I have to allow you to have your position and not dismiss it outright. There is a very good logical reason you have that position, but that belongs to you. Is that something that you were not extending to your father? Empathy, ultimately? I, I, I wasn't. Okay. I mean, now that I understand, I, you know, like most children, rebelled against my father's position so many things, right? I did not spend a lot enough time sort of taking, he thinks that way because of this, and giving him the space to sort of own that. And then me working within that space and, and not challenging him, but maybe working to soften those positions. And mm -hmm. I could have done a much better job at it. But of course, you know, you learn things with age and it's a little bit late for that one. But it, part of the reason I teach this course is because I don't see why somebody need to turn 50 to learn this. It's incredible the clarity we gain once we get, yeah. you know, <laughs> up at this age. So you understand relationships in a whole new way. Yes. It seems to happen around that time. So what we're really talking about is taking a good measure of your counterpart, right? Again, recurring theme, understanding not what you're up against, but who you're working with. Exactly. But the first step, as we talked about before, is I have to understand myself first. So a lot of the time we engage in, in a negotiation where, or in a discussion where I am not clear about why I'm there. And one of the important things is you have to know yourself first. You have to know why you're engaging in that conversation or in that negotiation. And also important, am I coming into this conversation with a set of preconceived ideas about the other person or what the other person is or the other person's position or interests? And I have to be very careful that I am honest about making that assessment not be afraid of the fact that I may come in with biases, right? Because unless I manage my biases, they're likely going to be something that works against us reaching the agreement that we want to agree. Yeah. Unfortunately, sometimes we have to work with people we just plain <laughs> dislike. How do you work with someone that you just don't seem to have common ground with? Do you have any tips? You've been through all of this. It, it goes back to really understanding what I want. So if I want a particular situation to happen, Right? I want access to refugees to a particular road so that they don't have to cross the mountains, for example. Right? And that's an example. And I have to talk to somebody in a government that I dislike in order to get that access. First thing I know is why are they causing the problem? 
Why are they in this situation? The second thing is they are talking to me, right? So if they were completely happy with the situation the way it is, right, they wouldn't be talking to me. They have no reason to talk to me. They're talking to me because they realize that there might be a, a different solution. To me, is about trying to figure out why they're doing what they're doing, see if I can satisfy their need while getting what I want. Who they are is not important. I wasn't sent there to change them. I'm not going to try to make them a better person. If you're clear what you want, then you get what you want, especially in the case of where you're dealing with benefiting other people or where there's victims that you need to make better, right? So you try to say, okay, why is it that I wanted to get out of this? And judgment about someone else is not necessary. If you were sure. going to judge somebody, don't show up yeah. because it's unlikely you're going to get what you want. Mm -hmm. Right. I have a question from a vet who checks in and asks, how can we present a situation or how do we behave in a situation where you're presenting something that you know the other person is prepared to say no, right? So how do we get from no? How do you think about that? that I think that's a cool question. Well, if the question is why no? Right? Yes. Um, and, and, and that's regrettably the question that we never ask. So we always ask, so what is it you want and how are you going to get it? But why is it that person says no? And oftentimes I always recommend that when you're particularly facing something like that, it's just a straight no, you start asking open-ended questions of that person. You start sort of insinuating ideas or trying to get validation of why you think that no way. So you might, they might give you a hint and then you repeat it back to them. So you mean to say that this is why you don't want it. By the way, it might be not them, but you. Right. So you, you want to explore the idea of the law. Actually, a no is an actual invitation to negotiate. So the no is, okay, so now that's a challenge. I'm going to figure out why you're where you are and how I give you something that you actually think is of value for what I want. That's actually what makes negotiations interesting. If, if somebody was just going to say yes, then there's no negotiation. I give you what you want and we walk away. Could have been an email. And, yeah. and nothing happened, right? Right. <laughs> Let me ask one that's kind of adjunct. It's related. This is a question from Keith who asked, what are some strategies for helping the person you are negotiating with listen better or um, encourage a little bit more cooperation? Is there something you can do in setting the scene? I don't know. I'm going to take the worst examples, engaging in flattery or something along those lines to help them cooperate and loosen things up a little bit. Again, we go back to preparation. Yeah. Right? Most people have online profiles. One of the things I recommend is Google that person. You have an example that I want to talk about. Right. Let's go so, into story time, right? So you were dispatched as part of your UN team to go to Germany to ask for funding from someone who you, if by all measures, seemed like she was going to be a tough customer. Tell me about that. Well, when you're asking for money, you're competing with a lot of people asking the same person for money, right? So you want to try to be different. At some point, I realized that if I went into people's, back then, Twitter, now X, or any other account, I could learn a lot about them. Particularly, you learn a lot about them in their, their use of emojis. Umojis tell you whether they like something or they dislike something. Yeah. They don't have to write it. They just have to show you the face. So immediately I knew something about this person that I could relate to. This person liked dogs. This person, you know, and I grew up with dogs all the time. So I sort of, we had something in common. I realized that now I had a way to talk to this person at a level that I would otherwise not have known. And we're talking about UN funding for, for a yeah, particular yeah. program, but, but, but dogs is your way in. But, but, but that was, if the situation got to the point where there was nothing to talk about, I could talk about that, sure. right? Yeah. So that's one opportunity that you have to sort of soften the situation. The other idea was, part of being a good negotiator is that you have to own a significant amount of humility. So I quickly understood that this woman who's very important and obviously very busy, was giving us an audience. Why are we here? There's obviously a reason she's taking time in her busy day to receive us when she could have easily said, I'm not in the country, I'm not here, you know, shoved us off. But we were there. Now, we're there for a reason. My job in that conversation was to, as quickly as possible, try to establish why did she give us an audience? What is the need that she's hoping that we're going to satisfy? Once I realized that after asking a few questions, I understood that their business model was changing and that they were being encouraged to find more partners on the, in the field as opposed to having their own teams in the field. Once I realized that she was talking to us to explore if we were going to be good partners, 
Then the conversation shifted. I was no longer looking for money. Now I'm looking for partner. So I realized I get what I want. I got better programs. I get support for my program by being her partner, not asking her for money. I'm no longer asking what I wanted. Now I'm giving her what she wants, which is a good partner. So what I chose to talk about from that moment on was completely different to what I prepared. But it was from the point of humility to understand that I wasn't entitled to have that conversation. She wanted me in the conversation. It was my job to figure out why she wanted me there. And that's what makes a good negotiator. A lot of the time we walk in with this position of power and we don't have any. In, in that situation, she had all the power not to talk to me. She had all the power to end in the meeting in five minutes. Something was keeping her there and keeping me in that office. My job as a good negotiator was to figure out what was it. And once I did, and then it was easy. And we got out of there a lot better off than we would have been had I just asked for money. Multiple takeaways on that one. I, I love that little anecdote. There's five lessons right there, <laughs> you know? Okay, listener Mike Vote is thinking about the same thing that I'm thinking, which is, should one ever compromise? My recommendation is not. Let's try to sort of agree on what compromise actually means. Okay, what does it mean? Okay. Many people confuse compromise when they say, oh, I gave up 10% of the value I wanted, right? But at the same time, they managed to get a relationship, a long-term relationship with the person they were dealing with. That wasn't part of the deal to begin with. So that's not compromise. All you did was exchange 10% of the value you wanted and put a value on that relationship of 10% of that value, right? So that's not really compromise. It's just shifting positions. Um, compromise is when we give up the 10%, and we get nothing out of it, right? What happens when you do that is, particularly if the other person, if you say, okay, I'll give you a discount 10%, and the other person immediately accepts it, then you start wondering in your head, did I give up too fast? Did I act too quickly? Was that more valuable? And I didn't know. Did I actually get the value of that correctly? It is completely unnecessary to go there as a default position. If you prepare correctly, if you actually make an effort to understand where the other person are and you know where you want to be, then there's a lot you can do to avoid that moment of compromise. That should come only as, hey, we're not going anywhere and I don't have any more time and there's a boss I have to catch or whatever. And then you go, okay, that's it. I'm done, right? But you're doing that with full awareness that you did everything you could to avoid that process. So, yeah, I, I don't recommend it. It's sort of the last possible option you can take. Okay, good. I'm going to play devil's advocate. And we're going to do this thing a little bit quickly, but I was thinking about compromise in a certain context. We're thinking about lawmaking and legislation. So when I think about legislation and lawmaking in the U.S., for instance, the conventional wisdom tells us that compromise, at least historically, as it's written in the original documents between the lines, is that we should expect compromise. We should endeavor to reach compromise when it comes to making laws. But in some ways, people that are opposed to that concept, right? No compromise, win-lose, zero-sum gain kind of thing. It ends up kind of stunting progress, right? So compromise feels like it's essential for getting laws passed. That's the way you do it. You make agreements. Yeah, but, but there's a difference between a lawmaker okay. and a politician. Yeah, okay. <laughs> what is that? A, a, a lawmaker <laughs> is intent in making law. And yeah. that person, because they want to pass something that benefits society or the community, right? they're more likely to find space where they compromise. Now, what we're seeing a lot, and I think this is where the question is coming from, a little bit. we're seeing a lot more political positioning rather than negotiations. Uh -huh. So, you know, we have a situation, an election is coming. I don't think people are actually negotiating or making laws. That's just posturing. So political posturing is not a negotiation. That's just political posturing. The way something works in government is you need, a, obviously, somebody's in power or position, and the other one is a constructive opposition. But by, by constructing mean, okay, we'll try to pass things that have both our interests in mind, but always benefiting the population. That's not happening here. Okay. And that's not where we are. So yeah. to be clear, there is no negotiation. There is just posturing. Okay. All right. Thanks for the clarity on that. That's kind of what many of us suspected probably was going on. Kim is thinking the same thing that I am, which is how do we count for profound cultural differences among negotiating parties, you've bumped up against this a bunch being part of the UN. Any suggestions for Kim and others? Well, I always recommend, and, and it, that's in the course, is how do you create a persona for the person that you're dealing with? What do you mean by persona? 
a, a lot of time we just actually draw up a stick figure and start trying to create a profile of the person. It, it's not always going to apply, and there's obviously significant differences from where you begin, but you have to begin from someplace. Now, depending on the culture, you will find that certain things are more or less a pattern. For example, certain cultures are more fixed on timing, right? They want to start at a time, finish at a time. They want structure in the negotiation. They relish more formal conversation than informal conversation. Yes. In some people like negotiating more in groups or not making decisions immediately. Some people value more a handshake than a written contract. Those things tend to run on cultural basis. Again, you always assume that it will change because you're dealing with individuals. Uh, but it's, you can begin to create yourself a profile so you can get ahead of that. Now, you're also talking about biases. Yeah. And you also understand that certain cultures come with certain sets of bias. It doesn't mean that you bless the bias. It just means that you accept the fact that you might hear something from that person that to you sounds like a bias, but if you're prepared to hear it, then you know how you're going to react to it. Mm -hmm. The last thing you want to do is walk into a negotiation with somebody who might carry a bunch of these things that might be offensive or distasteful to you, and then you hear that for the first time and you did not expect it because your face will tell, right? Most of us are not that great of an actor that we can just you know, hide the face. So, but if you're prepared and you know that it might be coming because of a cultural difference, then you will manage the situation better. So, but you can prepare for those. So let me ask you this implicit bias. I'm glad you mm -hmm. visited that. Um, moving on here, of course, you know, every negotiation is its own beast and customization is key, right? Again, you had kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, flexibility, agility, being able to pivot and change the overall goal. You went from looking for funding to looking for a partner, which was a higher level goal. Can you offer any advice as it relates to just kind of being agile and allowing for that flexibility mindset? Because I think that's critical. Yeah, I mean, you have to assume that even when you think that person is a lot like you, that person will be different. And because you make up an idea, the, the idea is, okay, that person will be different. Even if what they're saying sounds completely wrong to me, it isn't wrong to them. And that's the part about empathy and sympathy, right? When you empathize with somebody, you give them the permission to feel the way they feel. Even if they're upset, you have the right to be upset. I'm not agreeing with you. You, I don't, you don't have to say, I agree with the reason you're upset. You just have to give them the space to be upset. And it's very different from saying, I agree with you, because that's sympathy. Sympathy means you give up some of what you think to agree with what somebody else thinks. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go that far. What is important is that you don't dismiss their position from the beginning and that you try to figure out why their position exists. There's a story I think I've told you. I was in an, in an international negotiation one time. I don't know why I was in that room because it was about human rights. And at some point, a delegate from a South American country gets up and he says, what are you guys trying to do to us? You got us not long ago to agree to an agreement to respect the cultural differences of indigenous people and not mess with their cultures. But now here you're telling me that human rights are universal, right? So if I take them as universal, that means I have to go there and make sure that they live by the human rights that we have. So at the moment where he says that, when he challenges the universality of human rights, I was ready to think the room went quiet and everybody judged them. Everybody thought it was horrible. But when he explained to say, you're forcing us into a zero-sum game, either these things are not universal, because if they are, then I have to impose them on these communities that you told us to live alone, to respect their societies, yeah. right? So even in something like this, where we assume human rights are always universal, it's not always that way. This person had a good point, but until people gave the time to listen to his point, People thought he was nuts. We always have to allow the other person to explain themselves and then begin to understand where that's coming from. What is their experience? What happened to this negotiator seven months ago when he was in a different negotiator? And how about time to speak? I always recommend, I, I, I like standing up coffees. I like walking with somebody. I like having a situation where people are not fixed to the ground. They tend to take positions if they're sitting across a table from you. Yeah. They don't take the same position if you're just talking to them with a coffee in your hand. So if you have an opportunity to have an informal conversation with that person, 
you can then from the beginning, having prepared, know more or less where you're trying to go with your questions, start asking questions. People like talking about themselves. Yeah. So you just prompt them to talk about themselves and then you begin to come up with a clear picture about why that person has that position and how then you begin to present your position in a way that isn't challenging their position. Right. Once again, empathy, giving people the space to do their thing. We had chatted before and you suggested that the environment or the venue actually isn't all that important. When I studied and went to management and law school and stuff, a, a lot of time people said, oh, you know, you should negotiate in a venue that you control. You should negotiate in your venue, right? Now that assumed that negotiations are a power struggle. That does something right. psychologically different to your right. counterpart. Right. So, yeah. Bob, if you're, if you're in a place where you feel powerful and they don't feel powerful, then you assume that you're winning, right? Yeah. Which is actually goes, it's actually counterproductive. What you really want to do is prepare well so you don't need the power stroke. Now, there's a lot that you can learn from going to somebody's office. You can see their environment. You can see how they work. You can see how they're set up. You can see the relationships that they carry in their own office. There's a lot to learn if you're paying attention. Sure. Right? You only bring them to your office if you're trying to impress them and you have the kind of situation where you would impress them. Right? Most of the time, I recommend going to a neutral place that's nice, close to food, so that people relax. And then you can have a different level conversation if you actually think that you want to engage in an iterative negotiation. Right? Now, if you're just going to say, I'm going to buy this and you pay me this, and you have to, then you don't bother. But honestly, putting somebody in the defensive by taking it, taking them to your own office is probably going to be counterproductive. Um, so you mm -hmm. will try to avoid that. Good. Neutral ground. Any other successful tactical moves that you can share with our audience that you think are useful for negotiation? In reality, I think to, to me, the first, what, what really makes success is really understanding yourself. Learning how to control your tone of voice, learning how to control your presentation, learning how to slow down, learning how to not get jittery when somebody says something that you don't like. I think that's the key. Ultimately, the key is how do you manage yourself? And I think everything else sort of evolves from there. We don't spend a lot of time in managing ourselves. We take positions and we say, I'm going to go really aggressive with this person. And then you just take on that role, despite the fact that it's a new, right? We all fall in the range of being a negotiator. Some people hate it. Some people relish it, right? We all naturally fit within that scale. Understanding where is my natural position in that scale allows me to say, this is the type of negotiation that I am best suited for. Or if I'm the type of person who hates negotiations, just wants to run away the moment they begin. And, and there are people that are that way. Sure. Then I know that I have to prepare especially well to be able to handle the negotiation. If I were going to give one key is where you begin. You begin in understanding yourself as a negotiator and knowing how you prepare to dealing with other people. Right. And I guess we'll call that a vibe check, right? Just sort of under understanding yes. about the vibrations that you're putting out there and, and the energy, you know, all of it, slowing down, making people feel comfortable, eye contact, yeah. body language. If, if you prepare, you're going to be a lot more relaxed than if you just jump into things because you think you're the best negotiator in the world. Yeah. Just like anything else in the world. Yeah. Let's talk about your course a little bit. So as it relates to what we've covered today, what can one learn if, if, if we were to check out your course, we'll share the URL in the chat. What do you teach in there? Well, we begin by this idea of, of framing a new concept of negotiation as hopefully, I mean, you try to always make it that collaborative exercise in solution finding, right? And the whole purpose of the course is to give you tools that hopefully aid you into getting into that position as often as possible, or whenever you can manage. And those tools go about really getting to know yourself and actually figuring out your interest in the negotiation. Why are you there? What is the value, the true value that you're trying to attain? And once you know that, and then you're aware of, okay, understanding your biases, we all have them, by the way. Everybody is walking around with biases. Everybody. Only. And it's a matter of saying, okay, so I'm going to manage. So that we start the course there. And then it comes about, okay, so now that you understand yourself and where you're supposed to be going, then how do you get to know the other person? And it isn't simply creating a profile from social media is being able to sort of analyze that profile and sort of getting into the point where you say, what is it that I know about the situation 
what is it that I don't know about the situation? And what is it that I don't know that I should know about the situation? Mm -hmm. Once you make that last determination, what is it that I should know? Then you know how your negotiation is going to begin. You're going to start filling in that blank. Right. Because that information that you should know is what's going to allow you to hopefully convince this person that you're not there necessarily to take away from them, but you're there obviously to try to gain value for them and value for you because you only care about your value. The other thing that is important is this. There is no loss in creating value for the other person. Culturally, we have this perception that if somehow I go into a negotiation and that person walks out of there better off than they were, right, or that they were expecting to be, that somehow I lost something. If I got what I wanted, and maybe a little bit more value than what I wanted. That's all I care about. How they feel about how they walked away, hopefully better. But if we don't have to make them feel bad just so that we feel we won, right. um, which regrettably is the perception that we all have. Tarsicio, this has been illuminating and instructive, and I hope it's been the same for our audience. Thanks everybody for joining us. Great questions in the queue there. Tarsicio, lovely to have you today. Thank you. It's nice being here, Chris. Thank you for listening to Cornell Keynotes. Check out the episode notes for information on the Negotiating Policy Solutions course for me, Cornell. Thanks again, friends, and subscribe to stay in touch.